There's a lot of confusion in the church today over two key words, conviction and condemnation. One comes from God, one comes from the enemy. How do we tell them apart? That's what we're going to talk about today. So Nathan, we're at Ellerslie, and the students are arriving. The young men are seeking you out because it's like, hey, you're just such a wise guy. Uh, And they're going to sit down and and talk to you about their spiritual life. And there's one thing that we both know just comes up almost immediately, just, just right off the bat, and that's the issue of conviction versus condemnation. It's for some reason confusing. Can you walk through what we are encountering as leaders with a generation of Christians? Yeah, it's interesting when when anybody and we we notice this all the time in Ellerslie because whether they're men or women, they're when the spirit is starting to work on your life and you're feeling that pressing that prick of your soul, you you have that desire to be like I want to be changed. I, I do not want to live in that propensity of sin. I don't want to live like I've always lived in the past. I I want to be set free. But then what do you do with that pressure? Like is that of the Lord or is that of the enemy? And, and strangely, one of the things we have to typically talk through is, okay, how do you understand conviction, which is from the spirit, and condemnation, which is from the enemy? Like, how do, how do we work through, uh, so here's this young guy, and he's just like, man, I, I feel like every time I give in to whatever it may be, that that I just, I'm always attacked, I feel like there's no hope, I feel like I'm just being thrown in the mud, and I don't feel like I can ever get out of this. Well, you, we actually have to teach these students that that actually is of the enemy, Because the reality of conviction brings you to Christ, whereas condemnation keeps you in the mud. And maybe as a pushback to you, or not a pushback, but to flip it to you, uh, how how would you describe the difference between conviction and condemnation? Because we do have to deal with this, and my guess is everyone who has listened has had to wrestle at some level with that tension of like, I I do want to be changed, but there's this pressure, but where is that pressure coming from? So imagine that we have a cliff out in front of us. And so we've been wandering a long time towards this cliff. It's a cliff edge. What's what's up ahead? Destruction. And if we continue in this direction, what do we get? Death, destruction. And that fits in with our last uh, episode, which was on sin. And the wages of that is death. And so when you walk in the wrong direction, there are two ways that you can encounter Uh, the reality of your situation. And one is through conviction and the other is through condemnation. And the difference is night and day. Though though they feel very similar in the moment. Yeah, Yeah. they can feel similar even though they do have a different voice, they do have a different uh, tenor. And that is, let's start with condemnation. Condemnation, you wake up to the fact there's a cliff in front of you. You're like, whoa, what have I been doing? And this is when the enemy wants to come in. Before you recognize the mercy of God, before you recognize his goodness, before you recognize his redemptive power, the devil wants to get a word in edgewise. And this is where so many of our students are struggling, even when they're first arriving here, is they're so used to feeling like, you know, I... I'm worthless. You know, I, I've blown it. I knew what I ought to do and I didn't do it. I, I've sinned, but my sin must be so grave because I can't imagine God wants to put up with me because I have this voice that is constantly telling me God doesn't want anything to do with you anymore. And it's like, okay, let's first of all tag that voice. That is not God. The devil specializes in condemnation. Ironically, he can't condemn us. That's actually the role of King Jesus. He's the only one that can condemn us. But he specializes in reminding us of the life outside of Christ, of what he has, because that is, it's true. Outside of Jesus, there is condemnation. And so condemnation offers no hope. There is no recourse. There is no remedy. And so condemnation is meant to be heavy and weighty, and it gives you no opportunity. It gives you no hope. It's just like, hey, you might as well just jump off the cliff. That's condemnation. It is a terrible, miserable thing. So if someone out there doesn't enjoy it, I don't blame them. The problem is many Christians have blurred that because the pain of condemnation gets associated with just anything to do with your sin that causes pain is of the devil. You know, and God, and God does not condemn, so therefore any sting you may have in your soul, any grief you may have over your sin, oh, that's wrong. When in actuality, conviction is a blessing. It is a good thing. Does it have a sting? Yes. yes. <laughs> so let's imagine we're walking towards that cliff and God 
you know, blows and he blows this fog bank out of the way. And what do we see? We see that up ahead is certain destruction. If we keep walking in this direction, there's destruction. Whereas the enemy wants to shove us off, God wants the exact opposite. He wants us to turn. So what does he do? He convicts us. He shows us what's up ahead. He shows us the direction which we're going. And he allows a grief to strike our soul. And it's a gracious pain that he gives us so that we could awaken and do what? Turn. So conviction offers hope. It's showing love to us to say, hey, I love you too much to allow you to keep going in this direction. Please turn because I have a hope and a future for you. It's the exact opposite end result of what the enemy is trying to do. The enemy wants to shove you off the cliff. And if he could, he would. God wants to save you from that cliff. And so that's his entire work on the cross. It's his entire work of the Holy Spirit that is ministering to us is to rescue us from those consequences. He wants to turn us towards his benefits. He wants to bear fruit in our life. He wants to show us the goodness of his life in this land of the living. And so good. I think when students or anyone begins to understand this concept, you actually begin to invite God's conviction in your life. I love what Jesus says in John 16. He's talking about the role of the Holy Spirit. And one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to bring conviction. And if again, it doesn't feel good in the moment because it's, it's like that little hand slap. You're like, ah, that that's, it has a sting, but it's to awaken you so that you would turn. And it's amazing to me that the moment you start to recognize that if, if I allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my life, it actually changes my life. Like I, I will never progress as a Christian unless I allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit, because I'll just quit listening to those things that he wants to change and transform. And so as he opens up the closet doors, as he opens up the drawers and says, um, see, see that attitude or see, see that behavior or see that thought or see that language, I want to transform that. I want to conform you to the image of Christ. Well, if I don't listen, I, I will never be transformed. But when you start to recognize that this is actually God's tool to bring us unto greater salvation, to bring us uh, bring us into the sanctification, to bring us into holiness and righteousness, to bring us into Christ-likeness, then you actually start to ask for it yeah. and it becomes beautiful. Where where at this point, I'm like, if, if I don't feel conviction, I'm like, Lord, what's wrong? Because I actually want to, be, to look more and more like Jesus, which means I need his conviction in my life. That's right. Could you, could you share just as an illustration, the story of Jehu? Because I think it's such a great picture uh, of just this whole idea of condemnation versus conviction. Yeah, I agree. The, the The story of Jehu, a king of Israel, who unfortunately none of the kings of Israel uh, did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. So it's sort of a sad commentary, but Jehu is going to start and he's going to do in the beginning of his reign that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. So it, it is a pretty powerful illustration, but you sort of need to <laughs> know that he's not a perfect representation of Jesus, but He's a representation of Jesus in that story, This, at least this part, which is the judgment that is coming upon the house of Ahab and Jezebel. And which were very, very wicked. They were really wicked, terrible uh, characters, right? And so Jehu becomes king, and he is he gets on his chariot, and he's riding around, and he's destroying. He's just finished with Jezebel, and a pretty gruesome story that I will not repeat here. And then he's going to destroy the rest of the house of Ahab. And as he's making his way, driving furiously in his chariot towards judgment, and by the way, his name, Jehu, is one of the coolest names. It means Jehovah is, but the, which Jehovah means I am. So I am is, <laughs> which you know, is enough said. Just I am is enough, but I am is. And that's, is that a picture of Jesus or what? I mean, he is the I am who is. Uh, so I love that. But He's on his way to this judgment in this chariot, and on the way, he's going to run into this man named Jehonadab. This is in 2 Kings 10, 15. And he's going to stop, and he's going to... Jonadab is coming to meet him. And Jehu, in this situation, is in a sense going to extend his hand to Jehonadab, and he's going to say this, is your heart right as my heart is toward your heart? In other words, how are you towards me? And when Jehonadab says it is, and then this is what Jehu says, then give me your hand. So he gave him his hand and he took him up into the chariot with him. And then Jehonadab, because his heart was right towards Jehu, is going to now share in that chariot position. You see, what, 
if this is the king's position. Why would, should Jehonadab be allowed into this position? But instead of being trampled under the feet, or under the feet, under the wheels of the chariot, he's now in the chariot with the judge or the king. And I've just described Christianity to you right there. Jesus is coming, extending his hand to us and saying, is your heart right towards me as mine is towards you? He says, I want to save you. Will you take my hand? And if we don't take his hand, then we fall under the chariot wheels of condemnation, of judgment. But if we do take his hand, which is what Christianity is in a nutshell, then there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in the chariot. And that is the essence of what Paul is teaching in the New Testament. Is that, no, that condemnation cannot land on you because you are in Christ. You are in Christ's chariot. You are in him. Therefore, you do not fear the judge. You do not fear what only he can bring, which is condemnation. You are now safe and secure, and he has become your refuge from that coming storm, from that coming judgment, from that coming wrath. That's really good. <clears throat> Just as a way to wrap up, if someone is listening and they're saying, okay, I've obviously been listening to a lot of condemnation of the enemy, what would you encourage them as a, as a next step? In other words, how do, you, how do you allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but silence or ignore the voice of condemnation. One of the most important things I walked through in my development as a believer is learning how to discern the nature of who's speaking to me. The enemy speaks, which is a real frustration to us. It's like, couldn't he just shut up? And it doesn't seem to get him to stop talking. He just talks and talks. And I was going to do this, but I did quotes. He just talks and talks and talks. And everything he says is a lie. And so the moment you begin to recognize the enemy's voice, you just say no to it. You ignore it. You turn a deaf ear to it, and that actually strengthens you. You get this? This is one of my, I, I love this thought. It, it's sort of like a, pick, a pitcher in baseball throwing a ball your way, and then you have a bat. You know, you could let him hit you with the balls like, oh, oh, poor me. Oh, woe is me. Or you could get that bat out and start hitting home runs. And every time you want to throw another ball this way, kink, and you hit it out of the park. And that's the way we are. When the enemy throws a lie, we go kink and we hit it out of the park. Hey, that's a run for me. We get stronger. It's, it's like a, if you're laying on a bench and the enemy throws a weight on top, you're like, oh no, oh no. However, if you resist what the enemy is trying to do, it actually makes you stronger. That's why we go to the gym. We put weights on ourselves purposely. The devil's throwing weights. It's like a free gym membership. And if you resist it, you get stronger. And so when you begin to recognize the nature of the enemy, he's come to steal, he's come to kill, he's come to destroy. He's a liar from the beginning. <laughs> he's a deceiver. He does, he's the one who brings confusion. God is not an author of confusion. He has come to bring you life and that more abundant. You begin to separate out the nature. You begin to recognize that doesn't come from God. That isn't from him. That is from the devil himself. No. And when you get that down, game on. That's how Christianity flourishes as you begin to know what is truth. The only way to build up your discernometer inside discernment is to know the truth. You have to study the word of God. You have to get to know what is true so that the enemy's lies are exposed.